Hi, it's Ask Dr. Details. My guests are here from all over. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter at Dr. Lori V. It's coming out soon. And of course, it'll tell you all kinds of special things, including my interview about milk glass on the spruce. So maybe you'll want to read that. The newsletter's coming out soon. Make sure you sign up. My guests are here from all over. Everything's totally unscripted. And of course, we are recording live. Let's see, what have we got? There's one, a blue, there's a blue necklace. There it is, blue and light blue and sort of an eight beige. Oh, more blue, a lot of blue. There's one, <laughs> a blue, there's a blue necklace. There it is, blue and light blue and sort of an eight beige. Oh, more blue, a lot of blue. There's one, a blue, couldn't have, there's a blue necklace. There it is. Yeah, blue couldn't have planned blue. that. Couldn't have planned that, all the blue. So that's great, that's great. Well, I'm gonna start with, I don't know which blue necklace. <laughs> I'm gonna start with the triple strand blue necklace. Um, I'm gonna start right there. I'm going oh, to ask all the rest of you for your questions. So I wanna know what do you wanna know about this necklace? So put that in the comments. I'm gonna answer those and I'll answer any other questions too, personal and otherwise. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori, what's your name? Uh, Jean from Alabama. Hi. Hi Jean, how are things in Alabama, good? Hot, <laughs> very hot. <laughs> Alabama's hot. Well, that's yep. okay. So tell me a little bit about this piece. How did you acquire it? Okay, I went to an estate sale and uh, I always try to look for jewelry and stuff, but this was okay. for a dollar. A dollar, so, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I went ahead and got it because it had a marking on it, but it, the only marking on it is, it says, I don't know if you can see it, made in France. It says made in France on it. Okay, yes. so can you yeah. can you back up and put it up near your neck? So everybody yes. can get an idea about it. There you go. So triple strand, I'm guessing it's a choker. So it's between 14 and 16 inches. It's 16 inches. Okay. And yeah, there's a marking on it that says made in France. I like the questions. Thank you very much. And basically what it is, in fact, it has these molded pieces of glass in tricolor. So when you have gradations of colors, it's very popular in the 1960s to see gradations of colors. The other thing is, can you show everybody the, uh, the clasp? Yes. This circular clasp on this side with a cabochon, which is a curved, sort of a curved carved piece. Uh, you know, in this case, it's of course glass, but uh, opalescent glass or opaline glass, sometimes like milk glass, just what I was just interviewed about, you know, this idea of, of uh, glass that of course is uh, when you look through it, not no translucency, right? Can't really see through it, not like clear glass. But basically it has that cabochon uh, shape. And then if you turn over that, clasp, you can see, of course, the, the metal. Now, 1960s, obvious because, of course, of the style, but the gradations of color are very popular, which is a reference to not the 40s, Elizabeth, it's later, it's 20 years later. Why you're thinking it looks like the 40s is gradations of color, but why, why we like gradations of color has to do with Andy Warhol. People are like, Andy Warhol? Yeah has to do with the printmaking process, particularly of moving into different color schemes. So you move from one color to another color in the same color family. And they start to do that in jewelry design too. But that's a very nice piece. I like that piece very much. How much did you pay at the estate sale? It was a dollar. So some of the things I would look for, like my list of what I'd look for in a piece like this, I'd look to make sure that there are no missing pieces, right? So in all of the white or in the lighter blue or in the darker blue, make sure there are no missing pieces. Make sure that the forms are all similar in terms of their size. You don't want one that's much, much bigger than the others. You want to make sure that how the, the three strands and three strands, the law of third, you want you want the law of thirds. You want three strands rather than four or five strands typically, because on a choker, three strands is going to be enough. You get too many strands and then it doesn't really look like that choker look. That's what you want. So you're looking for that. You're also looking for a good, strong support system. So that's usually the chain that's holding them together or whatever band is holding them on. And then a nice sort of statement clasp. You have it all. That particular necklace has it all. So you didn't pay too much for it and value on it about $200 from the 1960s made in France. Oh There's my the gosh. There you go. Oh my gosh. You got based, on actual, based on actual sales records in today's market, because today's market, in fact, for the 
Costume jewelry, particularly chokers, are very popular on places like Etsy and Poshmark and Shop Thrilling and others. So you did beautifully. Now, when will it sell even higher possibly? Holiday time, right? People look for jewelry when they're gonna get dressed up. When are we getting dressed up? Not usually summer, usually not spring, usually more toward the holidays, right? So great piece, great piece. Good job, good for you. Do you usually collect jewelry? I don't see any questions. Nobody has any well, more questions? I have started in about a year and a half, I'll be retiring. And so good. I'm trying to get into jewelry cause it's, you know, it don't break, you know, it's cheap to uh, ship. So, right, uh, right. I mean, looking at your videos and trying to educate myself to when I get there, I've been buying pieces little by little. So right. when I go in, you know, I'll get something if it's reasonable. And I and thought, well, a dollar can't beat it. So You can't beat it. You're exactly right. And, and you know, I try to give you the lists of what to look for in all of these so you know yes. what to look for. And so the videos are giving you a lot of information that can help you. I always say, you know, I'm giving you news you can use. Congratulations. Good for you. Very nice. Thank you so much, Dr. Lori. Always my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, that was a beautiful one, a beautiful one. Remember, all of this is totally unscripted. Everything's live. I don't know what's coming, but that was a beautiful. Oh, Randy, thank you very much for supporting us. It's very helpful when you guys do super chats and super stickers. I appreciate that very much. And I try to keep all of the services low too. For example, classes at the time of this taping, $39 to participate in my two hour class. And if you want a video call, people are saying, oh, I can't afford it, I can't afford it. $49 at the time of the taping for a video call that's one-on-one -on -one with me. I mean, you know, we're trying to keep it as low as possible. I want you to succeed and I want you to know how to in fact make money by saving money. I show you how to save money. So hopefully that'll be helpful to you too. Thank you for the super chats and super stickers. Um, they of course help me know that, that you're showing your appreciation and they help us make more videos, which will help you too. Good, great. Hey, guests are here. Let's see what they've got. So the blue people are here with good, good <laughs> smiles. I like it. I like it. So make sure that you have a clear background if you can. Clear is better. You know, pictures and other stuff that abstracts, obstructs seeing the object is difficult. So that looks like a ring. It's And that looks like a ring that actually looks like a cabochon, but I can't see the front of the ring. And then we've got, then we've got an Asian... And we've got an Asian pot and we've got what sounds like a very big dog, but I like dogs. <laughs> so that's okay. He's a big dog. What are you going to do? Um, all right. Let's take a look at, well, we just saw a piece of, we just saw a necklace. Dex, let's take a look at this ring. And remember, I'm taking your questions. So what questions do you have about this ring? We got to back it up a little bit so we can see it. Yeah. Well, I think she froze, kind of like frozen, <laughs> you know? Okay, <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. That ring looked like a moonstone. It looked like it was, in fact, a, a sterling silver ring, but we're gonna have to uh, pass on that. Maybe she can get uh, the, the connection together and get back to it. So we'll, we'll do, they'll, she'll do her best on trying to get that together. And then maybe the big dog can <laughs> go outside and, and for a little bit anyway. Um, but I'm Dr. Lori and a lot of the things that of course I want you to remind you about, I wanna remind you about the specials and shop page. And I wanna also remind you that of course, Ask Dr. Lori Live is here to answer your questions. I'm happy to answer those. And they could be related to the, the object that's at hand. Or of course, if you have other questions for me that you're going, I really need to know this Dr. Lori, help me. You know, you can ask those, just type them into the chat. My guests are here from all over the world and thank you for joining me. So let's see what we've got. So I've got a piece that looks like the top of a covered casserole dish. And I've got a piece that looks like um, it is a plate. And is there a bottom to that covered casserole dish? And is yes, there there is. yes, there is. Yes, there is. Is there, well, can I see it? Sure. <laughs> you hide it from me? I mean, what the heck? Sure. <laughs> there it Sorry. is. Okay. That's all right, darling. That's okay. I need you to hold your camera horizontally too. That means this way. So it, oh, you're okay. You go. Now you're Thank helping God. and you're shooting outside a window. So I'm looking at all glare outside a window. Don't sit in front of a window next time. Let me look at this oh, wait, that, that has a head on it. Looks like it's a, a figurehead in the middle. Yes. Right? And I need clear backgrounds. I can't have all people picture stuff in the background. Clear, clear, as clear as you can get in your house. Hi, what's your name, darling? California. Where are you from California? What's your name? Northern California, Chris. Chris? Oh, yes. 
Hi, Chris. Um, so, Chris, how did you acquire this piece? And can you back up a little so we can see all of it? Sure. I got it at a thrift store. Okay. Is it marked on the back? Yes, it is. Let me turn that over. All right. What does it say? Cameo. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get my... There it is. It Cam says Cameo. Okay. It says Germany. Cameo. And then it's got... It says Cameo and then it says Germany, right? Yes. Okay. Can you back up? That means move backwards. There it is. Great. <laughs> okay. Can I see that? Now everyone's going, that was rude. It wasn't rude. I'm trying to get her to do it so we can all see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's nice. So hand painted um, with, of course, the the famous, the famous cr uh, crown. You also have some elements on either side of this particular figure. Did you only get one? I only got one. That's all they had. Only one available. Yes. Okay. All right. How much did you pay for it? A dollar sixty. Ger a dollar sixty. German piece, early twentieth century, hand painted, and of course the image is relatively famous. You probably recognize the image. All the curly hair usually indicates Julius Caesar. You'll notice, of course, the crown mark, which is one which would have been. You got a backup for me, hun. Um, and then I'm reading it at, with all gold leaf, gold leaf yeah. in that center and gold leaf all the way around. So one for 160, typically these cabinet plates you would see, and I'm guessing it's eight inches in diameter? Uh, no, it's more like 10. Oh, well, better. Okay. So more of a charger than a plate. Chargers are bigger, right? So serving plates. And this particular plate would have been more for wall decoration or cabinet, cabinet meaning display. Um, early, yes. late 19th, early 20th century value on that place, $65 for your $1 and 60 cent investment. Where did you buy it? Thrift store? Thrift store. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Do you typically, do you typically purchase them at thrift stores? Yes, I do. What other questions do all the rest of you have about plates? Type them in. This is your opportunity. So, and do you have any questions? Uh, Chris? No, I answered it. Great. I, I love your show. I watch it Thank all the you. time. Really love it. Thank you. I'm grateful to you. Hopefully you'll spread the word with your friends. Watch some more. There's lots of videos. Don't forget the binge link because the binge link will help you. And don't forget, of course, to subscribe to the newsletter and to the channel. Thanks for being with me, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Beautiful. Lord. Beautiful piece. Beautiful. That's called the classical revival or the or typically the Roman revival. Very popular in the late part of the 1800s, early 1900s. That one's nice. And of course, um, the German mark tells most of the story. You're seeing a lot of these types of pieces that would be marketed um, not only in the rest of Europe, but also abroad. Very nice piece of porcelain. The best way to store your plates. Okay, you may want to display your plates, plates like in a curio cabinet or a china closet, and you want to make sure that you have them. There's Sometimes there's that little indentation rail. You know, you can put it on the plate rail. That's one way. Make sure you open the china closet about once um, about eight hours, once uh, at least once a week, if not once a month, but you've got to at least do it once a month. Um, the other thing about plates is you do not want to stack them on top of each other any more than six high, right? That's another thing. Some people will put them on those plate supports. They're sort of like a, they're like a metal piece and then it has a hook and you can put, and you can actually put it on the wall as if it is a work of art because many of them are. Um, you can do that, but just be careful. I always tell people, rotate your plates one quarter turn every six months. Rotate those plates. And the reason for that is so if the sun is hitting them or if they have some kind of temperature changes, that it doesn't always hit the same part of the plate. So something will actually fade evenly. You want to be careful of that. Um, other thing about, of course, storing collector plates, if you have the original boxes, like say you collected, I don't know, Norman Rockwell plates and they came in original boxes or Royal Copenhagen plates or Hummel plates, keep them in the original boxes. I like totes. I like plastic totes. And the reason why I like them is if you have to store them because you're not going to display them, then I want you to store them in those plastic totes because they repel bugs unlike cardboard and unlike wood. And also, if you have to have them in a basement, if there is a water, um, if water does come in, you know, it won't go, get through those totes. Um, another thing that you want to think about when you're storing pieces, remember, no bubble wrap. If you're storing it, do not wrap it in bubble wrap first. Make sure that you wrap pieces and no more than six high if you're storing them without boxes too. You know, they have these little collectible boxes. You put the plate in the box. 
If you don't have those anymore or you never had them, I want you no more than six high, whether you're putting that in your china closet, your curio cabinet, or if you're storing them and no bubble wrap either. I hope that answers that question. Thank you for the good question. I wanna see those questions. I'll help you with the questions as well as with the appraisals. All my appraisals, by the way, are based on actual sales records. That means someone actually paid these amounts for objects like the ones that we're showing here. I don't know what's coming. Everything's unscripted. You just saw Chris. I didn't know Chris from California was gonna be on the show tonight. I had no idea what object she was going to bring either. I didn't know that the person with the blue vase had a big dog either. I don't know. I just know what I see and that's how we do it. So I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD antiques appraiser. My guests are here from all over and thank you for being here too. So let's see what we've got. A lot of blue tonight. Got people wearing blue. You got blue vases. You've got the whole thing. Well, we've got a kitty cat. Maybe the cat will be maybe the cat, maybe the cat will be quieter than the big dog. I don't know. Oh, that cat is not happy. That cat's like you're bugging me. <laughs> All right, I'm going with the cat. Then I might go with the dog if the dog is calm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How did you acquire the painting, sweetie? I found this on the floor thrifting with my mom. Oh well, is it fun? Do you go thrifting with your mom a lot? I, we love thrifting together. It's like one of our favorite things. So many of you tell me that. So many of you on my video calls and when you send in an email to the website or when we're on Facebook or when we're on YouTube or when we're on Insta or whatever it might be, you know, everyone's like, oh, I go with my mom or I go with my kids or we have a great time. So you found it on the floor. This is mixed. Oh, what's your name? I'm Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. And where are you? Uh, Pennsylvania. Okay. So... You saw it on the floor and you said, I, I can't leave the tricorn hat guy on the floor, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's in rough shape. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He, I, I think he probably have, might have been trampled a few times on the yeah, floor. Yeah, <laughs> I would think the thrift store, there was a little bit of trampling. Can you turn it over? Can I see the back? Yes. So for those of you who can't make it out, well, well so yeah. There's a patch. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this, first of all. First things first, I've been talking to you about the backs of painting. So those of you who are typing in your questions, get them in there. First of all, notice the, the sort of the um, temperature changes on the canvas. This piece has been somewhere very, very, very hot, like hotter than Alabama hot, okay? So hot. <laughs> so it's basically been probably in an attic for a long time. And that is where you get these striations, almost these stripes, like indentations into the canvas, okay? The other thing about this is this piece is a European piece because you can see that from the top of the stretchers. Chelsea, sweetheart, back up a little bit for me. There you go. So you see it looks like almost um, the top doesn't make a mitered corner like the angle. It actually goes straight down. That's a European painting. And then I'll show you why it's European from the front. So a couple things when you're looking at old paintings, darkness of the canvas, European paintings are going to show you, in fact, darker wood on the stretcher. And then the position of those stretcher bars indicates, of course, a European origin. The other thing is the way in which you'll, you'll notice that the canvas is a little bit longer on each side and shorter top and bottom. Do you see that as it's wrapped around? So where Chelsea's hands are on each side, that canvas is wrapped, it's a little bit longer, right? comes onto the back more. So they're stretching it this way as opposed to this way. That's an important thing. And that's something that we see in the middle part, of, in the early to middle part of the 19th century rather than later in European painting. Okay, the patch there is a relatively old patch, probably done in the 1920s to the 1950s. That tells you something about the piece too. The dark color of the canvas is one thing which I've taught you, but the other thing is also these striations or these lines that you're seeing, almost indented into it. Let's look at the other side. Yes, there are nails. And now if you'll notice, let's stay at the nails for me there, Chelsea. If you'll notice, the nails are pretty far apart, almost two inches apart, which indicates usually an English or German origin. From the nails, Dr. Lori? Yeah, from the nails, okay? English or German origin, about two inches in between each nail. When they're trained how to stretch the canvas, this is one of the things that you see from the Royal Academy in Great Britain. And you also see it in some of the art academies in Germany, Frankfurt, Munich, and such. Let's see the front. Now let's really look at the painting. First of all, it's a painting. You can see it is the gentleman with a tricorn hat. He's got three corners on that hat. He has a pipe. And he's got something on the table, which is actually kind of difficult to make out. It's, also, no, go ahead. 
I believe that is probably an alcoholic beverage. It's in a green, um, almost like a wine glass. Okay, so possibly a goblet of some sort. The other thing about it, um, yeah, it could have been in a fire, CB. That's right. It could have been in a fire, um, probably, or somewhere very, very hot. And here's why. The flaking indicates extreme heat. And the fact that you see, of course, the canvas was trying to hold on to the gesso or the or the glue that holds on the oil paint. So that's what you're looking at. Now, time period, first of all, it's a little bit small, but probably dates to between 1825 and about 1850. We said we know it's Northern European, England or Germany, probably. And then we have this problem with respect to loss, pigment loss, crackler, notice how it cracks. And people say, what do you mean? Well, a couple things you wanna look for when you have a damaged painting. You wanna look for how does it crack? Does it crack in concentric circles? Does it crack back and forth, right? In sort of big lines, that's one thing. The other thing you wanna look for is, is it popping and you still have the, the pigment on the canvas, it's still on top or has it gone away? Did the canvas actually flake off? It's another thing you look for. And then in this particular case, you see the curtain in the background. The curtain is the other telltale sign that you have a piece that's in the early part of the 19th century. Can it be restored? Yes. Ooh. Will it be expensive? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because what they have to do is they basically have to inpaint the majority of it. It isn't just, a, oh, we take off the varnish and we clean it up. This is the whole thing has to basically be almost started from scratch. The situation that's good about it is, you know, the actual picture, the actual image of him like bust length, top of his hat to about the middle of his chest is not terrible. The rest of it really is problematic. Um, how much did you pay for it? Tell me the story. It's on the floor. Tell me what happened. Was your mom with you? What happened? Yeah, we were, we were looking around. There was a ton of different frames and pieces of art on the floor. And uh -huh. I noticed this one right away. I love the dark kind of moody colors in it. And I held it afar and asked her if she could even tell what it was because up close it's, it's hard. Um, yeah. and so I ended up purchasing a few other pieces and I followed your advice. I got him down on the overall price <laughs> for, for all of them. So Good. I just. And, and, I and reasonable it. sellers are going to do this. You know, reasonable sellers are like, oh, she's paying for other stuff. And this one's not in great shape. And am I really going to conserve it kind of thing? So a couple of things would have helped it. First of all, a frame will protect the canvas. It looks like the canvas is pretty secure. It just looks like it's been hot as heck for a long time. You know. um, but value, how much did you pay? I paid everything probably well for every this piece in particular he insisted was twenty dollars. Okay, so he wanted twenty dollars for this piece. Okay, how big is it? This piece is about eighteen inches, I believe. So eighteen by eighteen by twenty two. Yes. Okay, so eighteen this way by twenty two. All right. So nineteenth uh, century, and that's probably why he wanted more money out of it because he figured he knew it was he should know it was nineteenth century. Maybe he had no idea, which is a lot of the time. <laughs> Value on that piece in that condition about a hundred dollars. How much will it cost you to get it restored? You're going to have to ask your local museum to refer you to a restorer in the area and ask for before and after pictures for similar paintings of this period. If they've never done paintings of this same time period, find another restorer. Can I and, ask you and, a question? Oops, sorry. Yeah, you can ask me anything. I read that. My weight is one of the things I probably, <laughs> no, I'm not answering that, but you guys could get. Anyway, go ahead. I read that before a certain time period, it was either in like poor taste or inappropriate for artists to sign their work. Is that true? You heard that from me probably. Oh. It was, it was actually, well, I know people get this information from me and then they're just like, <laughs> I don't know who I heard this from. Well, you know. anyway, I'll explain it. But um, yes, it was not seen the same way we see marketing of push your brand and it's fine to basically sign everything, which is really um, not something that you'd see in the 18th century. So the 1700s, it was seen, hey, I commissioned you to paint my portrait. Now I paid you for the portrait. You can't put your name on it to try to get work from other people based off of my portrait. Okay. One of the big examples of that is John Singleton Copley in the very famous painting of Paul Revere. So you can't sign your name and say, I'm, I was painted by John Singleton Copley. That was seen as inappropriate, uncouth. So yes, you're right about that. 
That is true. That's one of the basic ideas of marketing in the history of art. But the best marketer there was in the history of art was Rembrandt. And you know what he did? He would paint something and he'd never deal with it again. Or he'd make a, an actual print and he'd, and he'd destroy the plate. He was a person who was like, and I'm going to get my name out there. So he, if you'll notice, all those stuff, all those pieces of his signed. He didn't care about anybody else bad mouthing him that he shouldn't be signing the stuff. So it goes to show you that signatures would be important. So the fact that it's unsigned is not a problem. The fact that it's in very poor condition is a problem. So, but a nice piece and a great time to go and uh, shopping with your mom. What other questions do you folks have about this? And tell me, what did your mom buy? <laughs> She she tends to gravitate towards like random knickknacks, like like pottery pieces. Yeah, she's a she's a smorgasbord of what you might find. I buy the same types of pieces over and over again. I'm probably what you call boring. <laughs> no, well, what you are is you're a collector who collects in a category, more of a niche collector, and that's important because it's always good to collect in a category. Your mom just has fun shopping and probably has a great day with you. Nice to meet you, Chelsea. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful that you provide this expertise uh, in this setting. It's it's really amazing. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Keep in touch. And thank you very much for your support. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, lots of beautiful pieces, lots of interesting pieces as well. So don't forget, of course, totally unscripted. I don't know what's coming. That was a great example of European artwork, a great example of what happens over time with respect to, of course, um, pieces that become damaged. And what do you do? How do you get some help for it? What if you want to protect that piece? And then some of the iconography or the imagery that you see, like, of course, that nice curtain, which is very typical, of course, of European portraiture, and of course, how the pieces will look from the back as well as the front. I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. My guests are here all from all over, and um, I'm happy to be with all of you. Let's take a look, let's see, we've got a tall case ch chest, we've got some earrings, and we've got a nice blue and white bowl with a nice pretty smile too. Let's see what these earrings are all about. How'd you acquire the earrings? Hello, Dr. Lori. Uh, I took your advice and I bought a jewelry bag from Goodwill. And a lot of these Coro earrings were in that bag for $44. How did it go? So you got a lot of different earrings. Did you get the matches? I did. Good, good. A lot of times they do work to get the matches in the same jewelry box or, or jewelry jar or bag, depending on what they're putting it into, but they're very popular. So these are Coro. Obviously these pieces are from the um, 1960s to 1975 time period. Those nice big five petaled flowers. Are there any elements missing? No. Okay. The reason I asked that, what's your first name, hon? Where are you calling from? Sabrina. I'm calling from California. Sabrina, good to be with you. So a couple of different things. First of all, um, you want to make sure that there aren't any missing. If so, they're relatively easy to repair. A lot of people actually are in the business of repairing these pieces, but those are those are pretty nice. They're clip-ons and they say Coro, correct? Yes. Okay. So you've got those 1960s, early 1970s. And look at this, a couple things you want to look for. Look for clip-ons, first of all, right? Yeah, that means that, of course, it's on a hinge and it clips to the back of your ear. And it's kind of uncomfortable, but you'll get used to it. And then also notice uh, from the back, if you were to open the clip-on, I want to show you another thing in my list of what to look for. So basically, you've got the clip-on. And then back up for me a little bit, hon. There you go. And then what I want, do you see those circles in the middle of each flower? There's a little circle. So basically, they just make a lot of those as the construction element of these earrings, and then they just 